Cather died in 1947, she left a will behind that forbid the publication of or quotation from her correspondence, either in full or in part. This restriction was enforced by the executors of her estate for over 60 years. And yet, over the past several decades, scholarly interest in Cather's life and work has grown and collections of her correspondence have become available, resulting in increased interest in her letters. Scholars and biographers have been driven by Cather's will into a rather ridiculous and, I think, deeply ironic situation when drawing on Cather's lively and revealing correspondence for their scholarship. They've had to paraphrase her words. Cather's restriction in her will then didn't remove the words of her personal correspondence from the public eye, and instead forced them to be distorted by those seeking to explain and interpret Cather's life and works. In trying to protect her texts, Cather created a legal scenario in which the texts were mangled. And by refusing to collect her papers and deposit them in a chosen repository, the documentary record is fragmentary and scattered. This is definitely a creator that did not assist her editor. And in dealing with this content for the past several years, I have sensed a hint of Van der clear pain at the black hole of missing information. My talk today is going to emanate from the intensive editorial experiences of the past 18 or so months of my life, working as both the co-editor of the first ever edition of Willa Cather's Correspondence, and as the co-editor of a new open access digital journal, scholarly editing the annual for the Association for Documentary Editing a journal that publishes both traditional peer-reviewed scholarly essays and peer-reviewed short digital editions. These two projects have in many ways been exceptionally different from one another. The Cather Letters edition is a print publication with a commercial press focused on a canonical literary figure, whereas the journal is a digital publication for a specialized academic audience that is sponsored by an organization dominated by historical documentary editors. I hope to highlight this diversity of my own experience as a way to meditate on the themes of this conference. For my own work has encompassed competing editorial approaches, divergent views of textual authority, varying interface design sensibilities, and radically different audiences. And yet, these differences have not made me intellectually or psychologically unstable, at least I don't think they have, but instead they coexist comfortably. I must tell you a little bit about these editorial projects in order to give you a sense of the differences I've mentioned. And let me begin by explaining and arguing for the editorial <laughs> approach my co-editor and I have taken for our book, The Selected Letters of Willa Cather. Though I hope some of you have read or are familiar with Cather's works, many of her novels have been available in Europe in both English and in translation for many decades, it is useful to briefly explain who Cather is and why her correspondence deserves editorial attention. Willa Cather is important in American literary history as a writer of exceptional quality, whose work has been variously labeled realistic, romantic, and modernist. She was awarded almost every literary prize imaginable in her lifetime, including several honorary degrees from prestigious universities. And since her death, she continues to have a preeminent place in American cultural history, and receives great attention from readers, teachers, and scholars. Interest in her has been provoked by her fascinating life story, she was born in Virginia in the days after the American Civil War, but migrated as a child with her family to the rural Great Plains to take advantage of economic opportunities there. She got a university education at the University of Nebraska, a land-grant college that was optimistically founded in 1869, shortly after the state of Nebraska itself came into existence, and by the 1890s when she attended, was in, had an eminent and diverse faculty. She left Nebraska and worked in magazines and newspapers for almost 20 years before becoming a full-time professional fiction writer. She never married or had children, but instead shared her life and her home in New York City with another professional woman, Edith Lewis. She traveled around the United States, Canada, and Europe, and her diverse novels, including My Antonia, A Lost Lady, The Professor's House, Death Comes for the Archbishop, and Shadows on the Rock, reflect this wide experience. In the 65 years since her death, Cather's letters have had an unusual mystique about them. In addition to the restriction Cather put in her will forbidding the, the publication of her private correspondence, for many years the common story told by biographers and critics was that Cather and her partner Edith Lewis, who is also her literary executor, systematically collected and burned her voluminous correspondence at the end of her life. 
As you might imagine, the restrictions and supposed destruction resulted in a sense that there was something distinctly fascinating and mysterious about these letters. And debates about Cather's sexual identity in the 1980s and 90s further intensified this speculation. The few hundred letters that were known to exist were spread out among dozens of repositories, many of whom interpreted the restrictions in the will as a reason to forbid photocopies for scholars. So few scholars had the resources to travel and actually read Cather's correspondence. Cather's biographers, who did read the letters, were forced to paraphrase or summarize the contents of her letters. And all of this resulted in an extraordinarily frustrating situation for scholars and readers. Though Cather was a figure of importance, the crucial personal writings that survived her remained inaccessible. Some also believe that the inaccessibility of her correspondence contributed to a seemingly inaccessible personality for the general reading public. Unlike, say, F. Scott Fitzgerald or Ernest Hemingway, Cather's vibrant character was buried under her highly controlled, pristine prose. The claims of systematic destruction, which seem to me oddly hyperbolic in relation to the evidence, feel like a story concocted to highlight the absence of Cather's, records, Cather's letters from the public record. As one of her first biographers wrote, the testamentary restriction, quote, may be regarded in a very real sense as a loss to the corpus of her writings. The loss is even more heartbreaking if the erasure is permanent. I relate all of this not just because I can't keep myself from talking about Willa Cather, though perhaps that's true, but because this is the context that deeply informed the editorial approach to my edition of the letters. The inaccessibility of the letters across the decades led directly to key editorial decisions about text preparation, scope, and publisher. When the legal landscape changed and Janice Stout, my co-editor, and I were finally able to make an edition of Cather's correspondence, we felt a responsibility to do several things at once with this edition. We wanted to present faithful representations of the original documents, but we also wanted an edition designed for as wide an audience as possible. We knew from our own research that Cather's voice in her letters was compelling and funny, insightful and vivacious, and we believed we must make an edition that broke from an audience of academic specialists. Frankly, we wanted to play some small part in convincing people that Cather deserved even higher stature in American literary and cultural history, and we knew an academic publication is unlikely to affect public discourse on literature. In short, we felt that this edition ought to be seen like an important literary event beyond our community of Cather scholars. Our ideal vision for an edition of Cather's letters has two major components. First, a print edition of a selected body of letters that would be marketed widely. And second, a digital scholarly edition of Cather's complete correspondence, available freely on the Willa Cather Archive website. We frankly never were confident that we would find an ideal publisher for the print edition, one that would both respect the process of academically-minded editors and have the wherewithal to market a book to a wide, non-academic audience. We are fortunate, though, that Cather was published herself by Alfred A. Knopf, a publishing house that to this day takes pride in publishing works of distinction while still being a profitable enterprise. We wrote a letter and sent it to Knopf. And to our delight and surprise, we heard back quite quickly that they were indeed interested. After a few years of legal waiting and wrangling, in the summer of 2011, we were finally given a contract for the edition, and it will be published this spring in April. Choosing a commercial publisher, even one as friendly to academic work as Knopf, has had an enormous impact on our editorial approach. In fact, I would say that no editorial decision has been more crucial than that one, as it determined much about our strategy. We would make a selective, not a comprehensive edition. We would present accurate transcriptions, but we would have to design a book for an audience unaccustomed to editorial apparatus, an audience actually unwilling to tolerate certain kinds of editorial apparatus. We would have editorial notes, but we would resist making a note of making a book that was too crowded with annotation. And we would have to make a book that one could actually sit down and read, not just a reference work that one flips through or reads selectively. The selection of the letters was very difficult, as the inaccessibility of these documents made us feel that every piece of correspondence was of value and potentially held important information for research. Knopf rather generously allowed us to make a 700-page volume, and yet even a volume as large as that can only contain less than 20% of the total corpus. So selection was a key act in the making of this book. 
We had a desire to feature letters that represented Cather's thinking about her work, her personal and professional life, and the issues of the day. And we also wanted to be representative of the various tones we detected in the correspondence and in her relationships. The wry humor of a friend, <laughs> the frustrated affection of a family member, the confidence of the magazine editor, the abrasiveness of a hounded literary celebrity. And we had to make a selection that, to the degree it was possible, created a narrative. The letters had to work in relationship to one another. As someone who has grown up, so to speak, in the age of digital editions, where the promise of complete access to everything is realistically dreamed about and sometimes even achieved, it, is, it was uncomfortable to select only pieces of the whole corpus. I have grown accustomed to excessive access, and every unselected letter felt like a denial of access to others. However, my very hopefully, a colleague sent my co-editor and I a link to a review of a different book of selected letters in the New York Times, right as we were making our selections. This reviewer made a point that resonated deeply with me, and when she criticized the expansive size of the book she was reviewing, it, quote, suffers from bloat, she wrote, quote, a pileup of triviality that in the end isolates both writers and their respective accomplishments. The book reminds us that a jumbo-sized tome can work its own tricks with perspective and make its subject seem smaller. These words from a savvy reviewer reinforce the need in our particular editorial situation to empathize with an audience that does not want excessive access, but wants access that is shaped for them into something enlightening, pleasant, digestible. We didn't want to dwarf the significance of the corpus by burying it in its own expansiveness. We thought carefully about the editorial procedures and how the commercial nature of this edition would define some of our choices. We ended up, I think, with a reasonable approach, which our note on editorial procedures summarizes this way. Quote, we have made the utmost effort to present the original letters with meticulously accurate transcriptions, while also providing a reading experience that is unencumbered by superficial errors. This has resulted in a text that attempts to stay true to the original, including spelling and grammatical idiosyncrasies, but that also leaves room for very highly selective silent correction, basically when confronted with an obvious typographical error that obstructs reading in an original letter, like G-R-A-O-N-E-D for groaned, the inversion of the A and the O, we have corrected it. Some of her correspondence is typed, and though most is handwritten, but we tended to only silently correct the typewritten letters. As we state plainly in our note, our decisions to correct or not to correct were a manner of editorial judgment at each individual spot in the text. Though I confess in virtually every somewhat ambiguous case, I defaulted to not correcting the text. We did not try to represent the relatively few moments of visible revision in the letters, words overstruck, words added in margins, but only presented the final revised text of those passages. We insert some words and letters in square brackets, when there was obvious grammatical or spelling gaps in order to smooth the reading experience, while also acknowledging editorial interference in the text. We use no superscripted numbers or other indicators of footnotes in the book, but integrate our notes into, into interstitial passages before and after the letters, short identifications in square brackets within the text of the letters, and a biographical directory in the back matter. I believe that if we are successful in our design of this edition, the reader will be comfortably immersed in Cather's voice and virtually unaware of the editing. I must tell you, explaining our rather idiosyncratic editorial approach to this edition of Cather's letters to a crowd of textual scholars feels a little bit like a confession of sins. This is the first public-minded edition I've been a part of, really, and my previous work of digital editing prepared me to feel most comfortable with a rather strict diplomatic approach. And yet I feel confident that we made the right editorial approach for this edition. Our job was to design a book that gave ready access to previously unread words by an important literary voice. To us, it is important that we respect the preferences of non-specialist readers in making these texts available. This means resisting the urge to overcomplicate the textual presentation. If we were to fixate on, on details of crossed out words in this corpus, and which cross out words almost uniformly represent not substantial revisions to thoughts, but false starts and abandoned phrasing and quickly written personal letters, we would alienate the audience. 
Do I dream about a digital scholarly edition of the complete corpus of Catter's letters that gives due attention to letterheads, envelopes, marginal notes, revision processes, ink variants, and even geographic and prosopographic data? This book is not that edition. This journal, which I co-edit with my colleague Amanda Galey at the University of Nebraska, is a reinvention of the long-running print journal Documentary Editing and is sponsored by the Association for Documentary Editing. This organization, made up of editors of both literary and historical works, rather bravely agreed to our proposal to completely remake their publication into an open access digital journal that continues to publish essays and reviews, but which now also features peer-reviewed short digital editions. I think, as was the case for the Cabin Letters edition, I ought to pause just for a moment and explain the context that led to our decision to remake this journal, and specifically to the idea that the journal ought to support editions themselves. We are living through what appears to be the grand-scale reformatting of our cultural heritage. Text, sound, and visual artifacts are being converted into digital formats, and mass digitization is driving this conversion as governments, corporations, and coalitions of institutions gather resources to find automated processes to convert billions of pages into searchable data. Such projects are wonderfully useful, but as, I, as I'm sure everyone here realizes, mass digitization processes don't generally create reliable editions. Problems with textual and metadata accuracy abound. And as the number of digitally mediated artifacts grows, so does the need for informed editorial inter intervention into the process. Simultaneously, despite an early dominance of digital scholarly editing in the digital humanities community, we have failed to witness the promised, the promised flowering of digital edition making in the United States, as was, as was predicted by some a decade ago. The reasons for this are various, we believe, but rest largely on the absence of professional support for edition making. Digital editions haven't traditionally had ways to be peer reviewed. Most lack the kind of institutional infrastructure support necessary for long-term stewardship of editions. And many editors lack access to the transformation and design skills that would convert their XML markup for web publication. And to a lesser extent, perhaps, one could argue that digital humanities in the United States has embraced a technocentric ethos that is less interested with the utilization of established digital methods for humanities scholarship, like edition making, and more interested in developing new technological methodologies, further discouraging young scholars and scholars of all kinds from creating digital scholarly editions. It is in this atmosphere that Amanda Haley and I rather stubbornly decided to focus our attention on small-scale scholarly editing. Our journal is an argument for the value of the intensive editorial process. As we believe the preparation of editions is one of the most important scholarly interven interventions one can make. We have developed a rather straightforward process for publishing peer-reviewed short editions. We issue a call for proposals for editions and select a handful of those proposals to develop for an issue. We ask the editors to deliver TEI XML files and schema for their editions, and we create or modify XSLT style sheets and, and the subsequent CSS, Cascading Style Sheets to HTML to provide a web interface for their edition. After both the edition editors and the journal editors are satisfied with the interface, we solicit peer review from other editors and experts in the area of focus. If the peer reviews are sufficient, sufficiently laudatory, we publish the editions online under a Creative Commons license. We do not prepare the text or develop the markup schemes for individual editions. We, the, edition, the journal editors, do not. We do, however, contribute greatly to the design of these editions. It has been my role to take the lead in designing the interface for the editions and to write the XSLT code that transforms them into that design. The individual editors are consulted about the interface design, of course, and their requests are heeded in nearly every case, but we hope to have some consistency of look, a house style, if you will, across the different editions. And each editor has been supportive about finding ways to both showcase the unique qualities of their edition while also maintaining some cross-edition aesthetic consistency. In our first volume published in February 2012, we presented three peer-reviewed editions, and for our second volume, we anticipate publishing three or four more. Each of these editions take a, takes a considerably different approach to their source, including highlighting textual fluidity, forensically reconstructing a, reconstructing a textual state from an edited manuscript, and mapping textual transmission. 
In each case, an editor has designed an approach that fits with the goals and the audience of the edition, and to some extent, the journal. We have attempted to create a publishing atmosphere that gives editors this freedom to determine the most appropriate editorial approach for his or her material, even if such an approach is idiosyncratic within the editorial community. Our work on the editions, both design and otherwise, raises some natural questions about the porous boundaries between the edition editors and the journal editors. It has been argued, for example, in the discussion at the Society for Textual Scholarship at Penn State in 2011, that interface design is crucial to the intellectual work of digital scholarly editing. Perhaps then following this logic, the journal could be infringing upon the authority of the editors by providing editors with an interface for their edition. Perhaps scholarly editors should see our journal's choice of, a consistent, of consistent cross edition color schemes, navigation, and other elements as interference with their intellectual choices. Well, maybe such arguments make sense theoretically, but they don't make a lot of sense practically. As in our experience, the edition editors are overjoyed to have the assistance of interface design. Furthermore, the interface decisions are not imposed upon them, but made in consultation with them. Some editors make explicit requests for design choices, some ask for revisions of the decisions we have made, and one has even provided a draft of the preferred interface. And this process, I think, is analogous to editing print editions, which also require an interface design. Edition editors can certainly assert considerable influence over book layout and design choices, but those choices will have to align with the needs and constraints of the publisher. Without diluting the authority of the edition editors, I believe it is fair to say that each edition published in the journal Scholarly Editing is a collaboration between the edition editor and the journal editors. Though the edition editor is responsible for the text, the edition editor's influence, but crucially do not prescribe, the TDI markup, the design, the scope and shape of introductions and apparatus, and other elements. In this way, I feel that when I'm acting as an editor of the journal Scholarly Editing, I am, in fact, being a scholarly editor. This sense emerges from a comfort with scholarship as a social collaborative product, rather than a solitary product, I suppose. But it also seems to me to just be a practical fact of publication. Though there are isolated examples of works that are conceived, realized, and distributed by an individual, in the vast majority of cases throughout history we rely on one another to create and publish. These editors need what the journal can provide, design help, server space, peer review, long-term stewardship. And likewise, the journal needs what these editors provide, quality editions of works important to our shared cultural heritage. In this way, digital edition making only amplifies what has always been present in the print era. And indeed, I'm collaborating with a staff at Knopf from the other side in many aspects of the print edition of Cabinet Letters. We have been very pleased about the audience we have gotten for the journal thus far. Though usage statistics have limited value, we are gratified to see that we've had 3,400 unique visitors from 76 countries visiting the journal in the nine months since publication. More importantly, though, we've had excellent proposals from editors all over the world for our first two volumes. For the, for the first two issues, it appears we'll have about a 33% acceptance rate for the, for the editions, and we will likely be publishing more editions in our second issue than we did in our first. And our editors have come from universities in the United States, Canada, and Europe, and a couple of the editions feature international collaborations. We have selected editions based more on the quality of their editorial engagement than on the materials being edited, as our audience is the scholarly editing community, rather than the humanities field represented by the edited content. <coughs> We do not have established preconceived notions on what quality editorial engagement looks like, however. Instead, we are open to novel approaches and traditional approaches alike. As, be as both co-editor of the journal and its chief interface designer thus far, I have been forced to continually re-see textual artifacts through varying lenses. For example, Wesley Robbie and Les Harrison's fluid text edition of a chapter of the important 19th century novel Uncle Tom's Cabin in our first issue reinforced notions of textual instability and the multiple material and cultural circumstances that determine textual variation. In that same issue, Stephen Olson Smith painstakingly recovered a state of Walt Whitman's poem sequence Live Oak with Moss. His goal, unlike Robbie and Harrison, was to create a stable text out of a heavily revised set of manuscripts. And indeed, shortly after publication in the journal, an art bookmaker, 
use Olson Smith edition to create a beautiful print volume of Whitman sequences. Other editions I have worked with for the journal have included late medieval and astronomical treatises edited from use by historical linguists, a heavily annotated documentary edition of short poems from newspapers published during the American Civil War, and an edition that maps the textual transmission of a single late Victorian poem as it was reprinted and edited in a wide variety of American periodicals. After working on multiple editions, both digital and print, the idea of a unifying theoretical perspective seems untenable to me. Even approaches that seem sacrosanct to me, like one should never silently alter the source text, seem debatable in certain contexts, and with editions made for certain kinds of audiences. Each edition is a distinctive beast, and one must not approach it with the and one must approach it with the distinctions clearly in mind. The scholarly choices should be and will be pragmatic, maybe more than they will be ideological. The theme of this conference is editing fundamentals, the elements that unite us as we approach editorial projects from different disciplinary and institutional backgrounds. I decided to talk today about my disparate experiences, in part to ruminate upon unity, to try to figure out what it is that unites textual scholars across projects, across disciplines, across audiences. I don't think it will be too helpful to search for unity in the details of our edition making. The different sources, mediums, and institutional <coughs> contexts will make such a search frustrating, even though there are many overlaps and between our methods and approaches that will be informative and useful. Of course there will. But certainly we come together because there is something uniting our concerns. We are united by a shared commitment to the value of the editorial process. At some level, we want to make a corner of the human experience more discernible. We want to figure out how works of literary art are birthed. We want to allow others to read a document of great import, hidden among acid-free folders in an archive. It is simple, really. We are unified by our choice to edit. Though a good edition is a durable scholarly project, scholarly product, it represents one of many valid choices one may make when presenting a text. And the choices that seem right to us are products of our local needs, audiences, and contexts. And let me end with a brief example, which illustrates this point. Last summer, I participated in the Institute for Editing Historical Documents, sponsored by the Association for Documentary Editing. The Institute, held in concert with the annual conference, was in Charlottesville, Virginia, home to decades-long historical editing projects dedicated to the so-called founding fathers of the United States, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Some of the editors of these multi-volume editions talked about the history of their projects and how the editorial practices have evolved, from free use of silent correction and expansion of abbreviations to policies that encourage a more precise diplomatic representation of the source text. And the major topic of the conference was the ongoing reformatting of the existing print volumes for digital publication, something that is happening in part because the United States government passed legislation requiring the papers of prominent figures be made freely available online. In other words, e even individual editions witness their own evolution as the context in which they edit evolves. The approach to the text within one edition, a careful, thoughtful one, is unstable. This can discourage some, as everything edited seems like it will one day need to be re-edited as thinking and mediums evolve. But it's okay with me, as it reflects the inevitable localness of our editions, the way each one is embedded in the particular time and circumstances that created it. Plus, if everything needs re-editing, will help keep scholarly editors in business. Thank you very much.